Some time ago, I began filming a few videos in this training room of mine, the padded floors, I've got my weights over there, but more importantly, I have on the wall here some uh, long Chinese weapons. Now, a good friend of our YouTuber, Shinobi Hiryu, specifically asked me to discuss Chinese spears, the ones here on display. Now, I have to admit I've been a bit lazy, and also I wasn't quite sure exactly what kind of video to make on them, so I thought today I'd finally fulfill that request, sorry it took so long, and everyone else can watch too, and I'll just discuss briefly the basic construction, the spears I've got, and some basic techniques of Chinese spears, so I hope you all enjoy. Alright, I guess I'll start off with the spear which is atypical of the rest, as this is not actually a fully functional one, this is more decorative than anything else. Now, as you can see, there's this wonderful dragon head here, and the spear blade, which is much larger and thicker than any of the other ones, is just shooting out of his mouth like a fire. That's just absolutely beautiful. This has a metal shaft, if you see here. It actually has a join that unscrews. You can take it apart. I won't fully unscrew it today. And yeah, basically I bought this when I was traveling overseas. I unscrewed it, stuck it in a suitcase, brought it with me because it looked so damn cool. However, it's not quite, yeah, look at that tight. It's not exactly very functional as a spear. It's very, there's too much weight in the tip. There's actually less weight in hollow metal than what there is in some of the wooden shafts. And it just isn't balanced properly. So. It looks stunning, however, it's not really a spear because it's not actually 100% practical and functional. But yeah, obviously your eye is drawn to that first and wow, it's just this is quite wonderful to look at. Well, next up I have a very typical spear and it has what was advertised as a combat steel head. Now, I haven't looked for quite some time what's available on the market, however, even though this was advertised as combat steel and it is very broad and very dangerous looking, it's actually quite soft. Um, I did roll the tip over on this one, just stabbing into a tree. And um, yeah, I wouldn't recommend this style if you're looking for something to actually hit hard targets with, even though it's advertised as combat steel. Like I said, I'm not sure what's on the market and what spearheads are available, but that's the only really distinguishing feature about this one, other than that's just a very typical spear. Next up we have the double-headed spear, double-headed because it has a tip not just on one end, but on both ends. Now this seems to be a uniquely Chinese thing, I've never seen anything like this in the European tradition, perhaps it's a uniquely Chinese situation to find yourself just on the battlefield or according to kung fu movies just walking down the street and there is just an endless amount of guys coming at you from every single direction and you just got to stab them all and one tip just isn't enough to get the job done now i did learn techniques for the double-headed spear and i have to admit i'm not a fan but i did have a spare shaft and some spare tips so i made my own as part of the collection Alright, last but certainly not least is my number one spear. I call this number one spear because it's the first one I ever made and it's my favourite. Now this shaft began life as a, it's just a staff. Many, many years ago I converted to a spear. One tip broke off, I replaced it with another tip, the one that's on it currently, which is a relatively nice one. It's more decorative than anything, it's got a nice, a nice little brass ring here. This is bought from Hong Kong and um, it's soft metal, unfortunately, like almost all the other tips available for Chinese spears. Uh, it basically rolled over when I stabbed the fence post and I bashed it into relatively good shape of a hammer, but you might hear that little noise. Now this is a bell. It's got a nice little face etched into either side of it. The decision to put that on came when I saw an old gentleman in the park, this old Asian guy training with his spear, as you do, you go into parks in Asia, particularly 
China and Hong Kong, it's uncommon to see people training just in a public park with weapons. Now, his spear had a little bell on the end, and every single time he made a move, it would like to ring. And I really liked that and thought, boy, I should get one of those for my favourite spear. And fortunately, I sourced one just around the corner at the little market, and yeah, it completed the spear perfectly. All right, construction of the typical Chinese spear. Now, we'll begin with the shaft, which is almost always made out of waxwood. I'm not sure what the botanical name is, but it's, I've only ever heard it referred to as waxwood, and it is springy and flexible even when dry. Now, this is not like constructed like a quarter staff or a hardwood bow or something along those lines where you literally have like the trunk of an oak tree or something and you cut it into four sections and each quarter is rolled into a cylindrical pole. No, this is actually the entire tree or sapling, if you will. It's basically cut at the bottom and the top has all the bark and branches stripped off of it. And that is basically how it grows out there. There's little done to it. As you can, I'm not sure if the camera will pick it up, but you can literally look at the cut end and see the growth rings in it. Now, the reason for doing this, I guess, is why it's so springy and subtle. Perhaps it's a very common tree over there and there's just fields of them to cut down and have enough spears for your entire army with relatively little labor involved. Um, it also, I think, it has a very functional purpose. For example, if you imagine a rapier or a stabbing sword, or something with distal taper in it, which gives you excellent point control. It's the same thing with the spear because as the tree grows, it naturally narrows towards the top. So when you make your spear, you always put the tip on the thinner end, and that way you have a distal taper running all the way down, and it gives you better point control to be more accurate as to where you stick the tip. You'd never put the tip on the thicker end, and then hang on to the thinner end. It also means your hand does not slide as easily off of it if it's basically tapering outward. Your hand stops rather than just sliding the full way off. The texture on it too, very rarely are they treated with anything. In fact, it's encouraged not to be treated. The timber itself, even once it's dry, is very pale. It's almost white in appearance. That is when they're new. Essentially, they go yellow over time from the sweat and oil from your skin basically getting on it as you run your hands up and down along it and use it. So, as you can see, this one's decidedly a darker shade than this one or this one because it is older and it's been handled more. So, um, if someone tells you they're dedicated to their spear work and it is pale white, you know that's either a new spear or they're lying to you about how often they use it. Um, another thing too you gotta watch out for is sometimes suppliers will sell incredibly thin ones, like the size of your, you know, basically the diameter of your finger because for competitions in Wushu, they wanna be really quick and the strength of the shaft doesn't matter. It's not uncommon to see them literally snap their spears just sort of doing like, you know, a movement that like stops it dramatically and it literally snaps in half mid-competition all mine are relatively thick. This one's not quite as thick as the number one spear, but it's definitely not one that's gonna break too easily. And as we all know, realistically, in real life, as opposed to movies, no one is gonna be able to just cut straight through this with one blow with like a sword if you parry or whatever. And if anything, if you do get little cuts or nicks in it from doing some contact training, you actually see just how white the timber is inside as opposed to the outside. But yeah, that's definitely one way to get a good spear. Another way when you buy your shaft or want to test it is to put it on the floor and roll it across the floor. That'll show you just how straight it is. And if you store these like this, leaning up against a wall or a fence or whatever, over time it will get a bow in the middle. So yeah, if you want it, stored straight up or lying flat on the ground. But yeah, that's about all I've got to say about the shaft of the spear. 
All right, time to talk about the business end of the sphere, the tip itself. Now, every one I've shown you today are relatively conventional models. I mean, basically they differ a little in the width and the length of the spear tip, but they're all just standard spear tips. Uh, like I said, when I made all these, there weren't really good high quality combat steel tips available. So these are all a little too soft for my liking if you're going to actually stab into hard objects. But I guess if you want something that looks good and just is functional as a spear tip for practice, these are all good enough. Historically speaking, there is a bit more of a range of spear tips on Chinese spears. Now, some of them have a small mass of metal right below the tip, which essentially acts as a bludgeon. You can use it, they have a motion they call split in, like um, split in logs for firewood. You do the spear where you chop downward. And essentially, you have these spears that did have a massive metal behind the tip. It would not only add power to the punch forward, but it would also make it a good weapon to club the top of someone's head, even if they were wearing a helmet. There are also some historic Chinese spears which have a hook at the end. Specifically, I'd imagine there are techniques for these, but on the battlefield, you would try to hook the top of someone's shield and pull it down to open them up for the following thrust. Also, if their shield did not touch the ground fully and their legs were uncovered, you could hook and rip the legs out from the um, front rank of the opposing army. They also say they would try to hook someone on horseback and pull them down. So the hook spear is out there and it's basically, there are some very, very old museum examples of hooked spear tips. There's also something which I really should buy because it's just so vicious and so uniquely Chinese, and that is the snake spear. The snake spear tip basically is a wavy spear tip, almost like the end of a bread knife or a steak knife, but extremely large. And essentially what that is, is if you stab someone with the tip sideways, you then saw them as you like pull the spear in and out like you literally try and stab someone through the gut and then saw them horizontally which you can't do so well with this kind of spear that's um quite a nasty little head and i definitely should get one of those if anything just because they look so cool um below the spear tip you often have what is called a tassel now there are many explanations for the practical function of this however many of them are a kind of silly in my opinion um for example some people will tell you that the bright red color distracts the eyes of the opponent as it is moving around well that's kind of moronical because bright red stands out more and if you want to stab someone you don't want them to see exactly where your tip is moving and headed so having something that catches their eye makes it more visible doesn't particularly make sense like if you are trying to wave flags at the plane landing or directing traffic then you have little red flags in your hand because it catches the eye so having something that catches the eye so they don't see the tip coming is a really rubbish explanation other people say that oh this entangles the opponent's tip thus immobilizing it good job if you use this to immobilize the opponent's tip you've immobilized your own tip in the process um, now, most of this stuff's debunked, particularly the eye-catching explanation, because in history, this was made out of horses' tail, their horse hair from their tail, or sometimes from their mane. Now, there are no horses that are this colour red. You have some that are like a chestnut red or whatever, but most of the time it's black. Now, historical movies made in China often now when they want to be more realistic, will depict these as black, but most modern ones, this is just literally nylon. It's very cheap, these are like 50 cents each and they're all bright red for show. And it obviously lets the audience, if you're performing in front of them, see where the tip is going, because they need to see that. Um, the explanation which I think makes the most sense for the practical purpose of this tassel is that if you stab someone, or multiple people for that matter, they're going to bleed and this is to soak up and have the blood dripping downwards rather than running down the shaft making it slippery to hold. 
To me, that is the most sensible explanation for the tassel I've ever heard. And um, yeah, that definitely brings home the gruesome nature of what spearing was really used for in the old days when it wasn't a performance sport, but basically just a very effective way for your front line to kill the front line of another army. Another style of popular tip, of course, is the wushu tip. Now, how these differ from traditional tips is not only is the head small and round and safe, but also this section here. Now, this sleeve part on traditional spears, and you ideally want to shave down the shaft to this shape well enough so it fits on perfectly snugly and you have as much wood as possible going right up to the butt of the spear tip here to give it the maximum strength and stability. With wushu tips, the timber only goes in halfway. There's even a metal plate inside here which stops you from putting it on any deeper than that. Now, why would that be? Well, the clue is these two little holes here. This section is purposefully hollow with two little holes to essentially make the tip a wind instrument. Like, you hear that little whistle? So there's something very satisfying when you get out your sword or something and, you, and it makes that swooshing sound as it slices through the air. Well, these are designed to accentuate that sound. So when people are doing really long, ooh, that mushroom inside over the top of the head passes and other movements, it makes it that sound that whistles at a high pitch so that the audience can hear because these are more for performative than practical purposes. Another the reason you might want a wushu tip is safety reasons. Now, not only safety reasons if you're doing a two-person form in which you're thrust in and they are parrying and you don't want a sharp spear for the same reason you don't want a sharp sword when you're sparring, even if it's pre-arranged sequences, is because of the risk of injury, but also injury to yourself. Now, you might say, well, hang on a second, who would be stupid enough to stab themselves? Well, it does happen because even traditionally, we would have um, a red ribbon rather than a, an actual spear tip when you first get someone beginning this. They just have a uh, staff of a ribbon representing the danger end. When they start training, because movements that appear in both traditional and modern forms involve this kind of grip change in where you might shoot the spear forward, bring it back, change grip, shoot it back this way, turn and go that way, stuff like this. Now, obviously, if you are not entirely paying attention and you basically are fatigued or a beginner and you're given an extremely sharp spear, you might shoot forward, bring it back, change, and then get yourself before you turn. Or you might whoa, turn straight into the leg. Also, if you're doing this over the top of the shoulder pass like this, it would be quite easy to not concentrate and just puncture your own bicep by shooting it forward and straight back if you don't clear it before you begin shooting it back that direction. So if you're a beginner, one of these very cheap, very readily available wushu tips might be the answer for you. All right, one last tip on the construction of the spear. Now, I've discussed the material, the qualities of the shaft, um, basically how they a quick look at the head and the function of the tassel. However, you must tailor it to your size. Now, the standard way to tailor a spear to your size, or the length, I should say, is to have it standing up next to you, and when you reach up, the tip should end right where your middle finger ends. That should be the height of a spear that will fit you perfectly. As you can see, this one fits me perfectly. There are some longer spears out there. There are ones where it's literally double your own head height and they're very thick. These are more often though, not necessarily combat or anything you'd actually use, but these extremely long spears are often for standing there on the spot and drill in and since the head is so far away and since it's so long you need so much strength to hang on to it so they're more of a strength exercise those extremely long spears the most standard way like i said reach up and your middle finger and the tip should basically end at the same point 
and attaching their head in modern day. Most of them don't have any holes for any pins or anything. So like I said, you shave down the timber to get it as snugly fit in as possible. And then I like to get um, a very good glue, like an epoxy or liquid nails, as it's called here in Australia. And basically make sure it's nice and tight and glued in. That way it's not going anywhere. It's not gonna fly off or fall off. If you have one that has holes, usually I have two holes here and you put pins through, hammer them over, round the tips off. You don't want to use a nut and bolt and have stuff sticking out the side. Not only would it look unattractive, but it could catch on your skin if you were like holding up here close to the tip. But yeah, that's basically how you attach the head and how you tailor it to your own personal height. And there are some shorter spears like the one I had before that was just a kid's one. However, the techniques for shorter spears, there is a, um, a different school where they use two short spears, one in each hand, and do techniques with them. I'm completely unfamiliar with this technique, so I'm not really going to talk. All right, time to do some actual spear techniques. Now, I don't claim to be a master sifu of any particular style. But I do know a thing or two, and the movements I'll show you are basically universal to most traditional and modern versions of Kung Fu and how you stab and use this weapon. Now, the most obvious technique is the thrust. Alright, so now, there is, where you start the thrust, usually from a stance, this is what some souls call it the half horse stance, whatever your particular system calls it. Usually you squat down. You can be staying up higher or basically more casual. But yeah, often you'll settle down in a sense. How far back you have your hand is entirely up to you. I prefer to have it past the hips. Some people have it on the hip. Rarely do you see people having it here in front of the leg or hip joint. Usually it's either on or behind and you thrust. Now the full work for the thrust is basically you go from here, you turn on the toe and push. The hips snap forward, the waist turns and you put that power from your shoulder into your hand. It's like you're throwing a really hard punch. So basically we're here, we thrust and back, thrust and back. You don't want it like to leave the tip hanging out or a person can grab it in case you miss. Now, you thrust primarily with the rear hand. The front hand aims and supports it. So if you could imagine it is more like um, playing snooker or pool. Your back hand pushes and the front hand is just there to guide the tip. The reason you do this is because if you hang on with the front hand, that's gonna slow it down. You want the tip to go as forcefully and as hard forward as possible. The other thing is use just the back hand for the thrust. You don't thrust with both hands. Now, there's a few reasons for this, which I'll briefly go into. Um, basically, you might see people do this, but that's when you have a movie and there's guys in the background those dudes don't know anything and they've been paid a sandwich and a can of coke to show up on the film set that day. They toss them a spear, put them in a cheap costume and then they stand there doing this with each other all day in the background while your main characters fight in the foreground. That's a bit of a rubbish technique. Now, there are some uses for that. For example, traditionally, that style there with both hands can be used as a fake to think, make them think you're going that way. However, that's not like a proper thrust. The most obvious reason why that's stupid is if you do not let go of the front hand, even if you've got both hands close together, if you're thrust in like this, using both arms, you may think, oh, that's goal of force was two arms are better than one, but you're giving up so much range. If I'm standing here like this and thrusting like that, the spear tip's literally moving that far. So if you can imagine the opposite, that means your opponent literally must be standing 
this close to your spear tip. I don't think anyone's going to do that. Whereas with a proper thrust, you're literally gaining pretty much from this hand to here is how far you're thrusting. That's literally over a metre or over three feet for our American friends. So you thrust out here. And the footwork is linked, like I said, to the motion. I'll try if you're in front of the camera. So you see if I thrust just with the arm, if I thrust with the whole body, you're just seeing the difference of the vibration of the staff, exactly how much power or more power there is in the full body thrust. Now, um, that's pretty much the main way you thrust the spear. There is variations on it. Like I said, sometimes that is a fake, but that's rarely ever real thrust. Sometimes I'll do like what might in swordsmanship be called a passing step where you will literally basically go out, change your footwork to more of a, a rapier or something like lunge forward and that way you're getting not only this much reach but you're adding that to it so you said forward shoot it out one hand that is like the longest spear thrust you can do now the other thing you'll remember too is retract immediately sometimes in um forms they'll thrust the spear and leave it out there but in real life when you go with someone, you want to pull it back. In case you miss, you don't want to give them the opportunity to grab the end of the spear and hang on to it, because if they're hanging on to the end of your spear, there's not much you can do at that point. All right, the other most fundamental technique or series of techniques with the spear is parry-parry thrust. Now, anyone who's seen a performance of Wushu or Chinese spear, or a kung fu movie which involves spear play has probably seen these movements and are familiar with them. However, there are two distinct versions of this fundamental sequence of movements. And depending on what you train, you often stood there and you practice one over and over and over again. Now there is the long version and the short version. The longer version, which has larger footwork and motion of the spear, is favoured in traditional styles, although they have both in their forms, they favour the longer version more. The shorter version, on the other hand, is more prevalent in modern Wushu. So, um, we'll look at both of them, saying the longer version. Now, the longer version, in its entirety, looks like this. One, two, thrust. One, two, thrust. Now, basically, you are flipping by turning, pivoting at the elbow and turning the wrist over is the first motion, accompanied by the footwork of a reverse front stance. So if you imagine you're doing like a lunging stance backward as you turn this wrist over and rotate at the elbow and the spear tip goes down in a parrying arc in motion, then you just basically return to the original position doing a parry this way and retaking the center. The idea obviously if they thrust, and you've parried their thrust down, when you retake the centre, you tag their front hand, and then thrust over their weapon into their stomach. So, with one, two, thrust. So the thrust basically is exactly as described earlier, after the two parries, because you've returned to the centre technique. So it's parry, retake the centre, thrust. Now the front hand does very little as you rotate up. It basically just turns over. You're not pulling with the front hand. It is just again, much like the thrust, it's a guide, not necessarily adding much to the motion. So if you do it to the camera, we say hit, thrust, thrust. And parry, parry, thrust, I should say. That's parry, parry, thrust. Another variation is if you are, this is primarily parrying with the section of spear, which is 
ahead of your front hand. So that is doing the parrying and the work, this part here. So the pivot point is on your front hand. So whatever shape or motion you form the back hand is mirror opposite on the section of the spear, which is past your front hand. So this is what we're using. However, a slight variation of the movement uses the back end. This is more of a emergency style thing. If they're past your spear and they're coming up here, you can do this style of parry. Now, basically all this is, is it's replacing the elbow with the shoulder. See that? So it's the same move, the replacing elbow turn with the shoulder to utilize this part, the part between your hands to do the defensive cover of your body. But in principle, it's the same basic motion, just with, like I said, shoulder instead of elbow. So you can change up the footwork. They often do in traditional forms. For example, when you go this one here, they will often accompany that with this crossing or gathering step and then you sit back down into a reposition and go again. So there's a few variations which add to it, but it's the same principle or mechanic throughout the entire technique. All right, now we have the second variation on the exact same sequence, that is the short parry-parry thrust. That is his favorite in Wushu, and you've probably seen it quite often. And this is the reason why they want really skinny, finger thick staves because they want the head to like really bounce up and down as they do it. So it's a much more subtle technique and it has the exact opposite of the other one as in we instead of using the rear hand to drive the motion, this is all front hand. So the rear hand remains relatively stationary. Again, it is just turned over as we do the motion and you go one over, two over, one over, two over one over, two over. Now there's not much footwork, although there is the body. So as you go over this way, lean back a bit, down, thrust. So it's one, two, three, like that. Hold to the camera, one, two, three. One, two, three. Now, it's kind of hard, this is very subtle. This is almost like if you have a sword and you are just doing very small parries like this. It's a very, very tiny. You are not going side to side. It's not this. Thrust. Thrust. It is one, two. So the spear tip goes in an arc in motion. Now, because of the length of the spear, just this little motion here is enough to cover a fair bit of the center of my body, for example. I do here towards the camera, you can see, you can come over the spear and get me here, 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 here. Just doing that little wipe up brings the tip basically almost to the height of the top of my head. One, two, one, two, one, two. Especially lean back a bit and you pull a little power. Now, this something very important which a lot of people miss about these two parries is they hold it out in midair and do this. That is far too weak. Now, depending on the depth of your stance, the length of your arms, how far back your grip in the spear. To do this properly, you either want it making contact here and being braced on your leg or on your stomach, depending on where you've got it. You don't want the hand just out in midair because there's not really, you want at least one hand anchored. So yeah, same thing. One, two, thrust. One, two, thrust. And that's your second more compact version of that fundamental sequence.
Now, like I said, this video is primarily a favour to um, a friend of mine on YouTube who asked me to talk about my spears. I wasn't quite sure how to tackle the subject and hopefully I haven't been too boring and rambling in my explanations and hopefully this was the information you wanted. If you have any questions or any ideas on other topics like this or what you want me to answer, happily answer them and I promise from now on I will be a lot more prompt and fast in my video making replies. Anyway, I hope you have a good day and I hope you at least got something about this little discussion on Chinese spears. You know, like I said, I'm not an expert but I do know a thing or two and yes, hopefully you might have learned something. Have a good day.